With the country gearing up for the 2023 general elections, the People's Democratic Party and the All Progressives Congress will be facing major competition from other political parties looking to unseat them at various levels in all states across the country. If there is one state that PDP can't afford to lose, it will be the oil-rich river state. The governor of the state near Samwike can be described as one of the major stakeholders of the PDP as he has played a major role in making sure the main opposition party remains a force to be reckoned with in the country. The All Progressives Congress and other parties will have to put up a good fight to dislodge the PDP in River State. The Accord Party is one of the parties that will be seeking to wrestle power from the People's Democratic Party come 2023. The party's governorship candidate, Lulo, Dumo Lulu Briggs, I beg your pardon, has promised to run an inclusive government if he emerges as governor of River State in 2023. Joining us on the show this morning as we discuss his plans for River State and his strategies to oust the PDP in River State is Dumo Lulu Briggs, governorship candidate of Accord Party River State. Good morning and welcome to the show. Thank you so very much. Good morning. Well, it's good to have you on the program. Thank you. You've been quoted uh, elsewhere as saying that the uh, Accord Party has such a strong structure on the ground in River State and uh, very strong candidates as well uh, to be able to dislodge the uh, People's Democratic Party from power in River State. River State uh, being known as a traditional PDP uh, stronghold. Yeah. What gives you that con confidence uh, that uh, your structure in River State is stronger than that of the People's Democratic Party? Well, um, I wouldn't say it's stronger. We'll, we'll test that at the polls um, in, in 2023. But um, I would say that it's as strong as you, know, you, you can imagine. We have um, candidates you know, for all the elected positions for the three senatorial seats. We do have candidates. We have candidates for the 13 you know, reps um, seats, candidates for the 32 House of Assembly seats, and then we also have me. You know, running you know for governor, so we are quite grounded. Um, you won't mention you know political parties in River State today and not mention the Accord. Uh, in the past, you probably say you know it's the All Progressive Congress and the People's Democratic Party, but today you would reckon you know with the Accord. We are everywhere, and our message is resonating with the younger people, you know, with the mid with the middle class, uh, with the, the business community. In fact, with everybody, you know, in River State, I mean, this is just that time when I called, you know, we made the difference at the next elections. Well, you just mentioned younger people. You have your WE agenda, which is a PVC registration and collection drive targeted at the youth. Is that one of your main constituencies? And how are you positioning yourself as a candidate for the youth? Well, you know, I've always um, you know, been minded about um, younger people. Um, I have a foundation called the the more Youth Foundation 23, you know, which uh, runs across all 23 local government areas and provides opportunities for young people. You know, uh, we are trying to reposition, you know, young people. So I would probably say that that's my primary constituency. But the real agenda is not just for the young. The real agenda is for, for everybody. We are saying that, you know, that you matter, that um, you come first, you know, and that we must put people first. You would agree with me that the years from 1999, you know, to now, have been disastrous for opportunities and also for equality. So for the first time, you know, people are beginning to feel, you know, that they're going to they're to have a government that will be very concerned about them, that will put their ideas, their views, you know, and their interests, you know, at the, at the front burner. That's what the WE agenda is about, is that you matter, that everybody matters. And so we're going to run an all-inclusive government. And if you've um, noticed, we try to ensure that even in our campaigns, you know, we're mindful of the sort of language that we employ, because what's more important to us is the opportunity to have, you know, a state that is cohesive, you know, uh, after the elections, so that governance, you know, can be made easy. So we're not trying to employ language that will probably create irreconcilable differences. So in, so in the manner that everybody will feel, you know, okay, you know, even though I'm not a member of the Accord, I'm, I'm in the PDP. Even though I'm not a member of the Accord, I'm in the APC or I'm in the APGA. I think that this is a government, you know, that I can, you know, you know, entrust my future to. So. We're very mindful of the sort of things that we put out, and by the special grace of God, we shall win the elections and try and heal the wounds. You know, there has been too much hate in our politics. Uh, the camaraderie we used to enjoy in our politics is gone, and so even the putting down of hate is enough for our agenda for the next government. You know, in River State.
And people have asked me, you know, like you say, the APC is strong, the PDP is strong, it's a stronghold of the PDP. People have come to me to say, look, the PDP had, you know, some high level of acrimonious, you know, primaries. The APC also had some issues about how their candidates emerged. And so why didn't you try to exploit, you know, the anger against Wiki and Amici? And I've said, I don't think that I need to exploit that, you know, because the temperature of governance we need in river states in the next administration will not be helped, you know, by trying to exploit, you know, the anger of anger against Wiki or against Amici. I think that we need, you know, to have a strong desire, you know, by reverse people for a truly representative, you know, and progressive government. So that's what we're trying to look at. So everybody is happy with us, and the language that we're employing, you know, it's, um, it's mindful of the interests of everybody else, you know, and it's looking to the future, it's looking to the day after the elections. And that's happening because we are very certain that 2023 is going to be a very defining moment for us, and we're most likely going to win elections, you know, and inform the government, and we should be able to. As we say, that it's going to be a government that will accommodate everyone. We should be able to, you know, have presented such such framework through our campaigns and all of that. You participated in the 2019 elections. Uh, you didn't make any traction, not traction. Uh, a lot of people are saying probably nothing will change this time around in this uh, 2023 election, that their court is not a strong party on ground. And also, so, secondly, they expressed concerns that what you might want to say is a political strength for you is because for you know, the River Rhine areas, you know, the Bonama area, the Upland area. And there's also Tonya Cole as also a veritable candidate pushing the agenda of the River Rhine area from that area. And thirdly, people are saying if you were that close to Wiki uh, and you really were interested in this governorship, then why can't he help you out? Because a lot of people have established your close relationship with Governor Yusuf Wiki. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> I feel that you will say that I'm close to virtually everybody. Uh, the sort of policy I've played is without bitterness, you know, and I've been in this business, you know, for quite a while. From 1999, when I was just, uh, you know, a supporter of the PDP to when I actually contested in 2003. So I'm, I'm friends with almost all the active political, you know, players, you know, in Rivers, including the governor. The, the governor. And uh, these things are not, you know, gifted. So Wiki wouldn't give it to me because, you know, I'm, I'm close to him. You will have to assess me based on you know uh, our relationship and based on what his own agenda is you know for for reverse going forward, and I'm not an establishment person, so I may not you know suit that. But let us try you know and uh, put in perspective what what happened in 2019. In 2019, uh, we were all you know in the All Progressive Congress uh, until um, Tony Cole you know was uh, chosen by the leader of the party you know in the states, and some of us didn't like the way you know it happened. So I became a candidate, you know, of the accord through the substitution. And then, of course, because they saw the traction that, you know, my, you know the, the accord, you know, you know, was gaining, by the day, the amount of young people, traders, you know, other men and women on the streets were coming out, you know, supporting the accord. An action was brought before the Federal High Court that I wasn't a candidate of the party. And then the judge ruled, you know, that I wasn't a candidate of the party. And that somebody who, who claimed that he was chairman of a court party and that he did some sort of primaries and then he emerged at that primary and was the candidate, you know, was upheld as the candidate of the party, you know, by the Federal High Court. So we had to go on appeal and then we won the appeal a day before the elections. And then the judgment in the, in the, in the journal of, of, the, of the Federal High Court, the judge said that I, should, I shouldn't campaign, I shouldn't parade myself as a candidate, so I couldn't campaign. And at some point a lot of people felt that I, could, I wasn't on the ballot. So even in my village, you know, when I arrived, you know, on the morning of the election, a lot of people didn't know that I was still on the ballot. So that was the confusion, you know, that followed it. But look at the records. The court party still came third. In River State at the time. So it's not a party that was on, you know, that wasn't getting traction or that people were not listening to what I was saying. The message, you know, was resonating uh, with the people of River State. But again, you know, going forward after uh, four, you know, four, four more years of the PDP government, I think that they all agree that it's time, you know, for a change. And then, you know, I'd like us to look at what it was in River State in 1999 and what it is with us today, you know, in 2003. You will agree that um, in 1999, everybody felt that, you know, if two states uh, were to make tremendous progress, you know, in Nigeria, they would be, that those states would be Rivers and, um, and Lagos. And that happens, of course, you know, if... Um, they think that, you know, commerce will thrive in those environments. And once you have your seaports and your airports, 
the, the thinking is that commerce will thrive in such environments. So in Lagos, they had their seaports, you know, and their airports, both um, domestic and international. The same thing with us in rivers. And then, you know, in rivers, of course, additionally, we had the petrochemicals, we had NAFCON, and we had the refineries. And by military decree, all the multinational oil companies had their headquarters in Port Harcourt. So I would say that that gave us a slight competitive edge. But what I think that gave us the biggest competitive edge was the fact that in 1999, Lagos State had the worst security situation in the entire country. There were incessant killings, you know, daylights, you know, robberies, and all sorts in Lagos. It was so bad that every street in Lagos had a gate. And those gates were shut at 6 p.m. So if, at that, of course, at that time, we didn't even have the GSM. So even if your wife suspected that, well, that you probably, you know, uh, was having something, you know, with, with someone, you know, in the neighborhood, she would appeal to you that, look, my darling husband, if you can't come home by 6 o'clock, stay wherever you are and come in the morning. She wanted your life. That was how bad it was in Lagos in 1999. Today, that same Lagos it runs a 24-hour economy. And it is said that Lagos is the, the fourth largest economy or the fifth, you know, in Africa. That is, once you take out Nigeria, South Africa, and Egypt, then Lagos is right as the biggest economy. So it's no rocket science. And we worry, as people in rivers, that it is two, these two states we are at par. Now, where is rivers here today and where is Lagos State today? So there's a reason, you know, why people are thinking that, look, we need someone who knows what to do, someone who is determined to do what it will take, you know, to be there. And I'll give you a very strong example and that will tell you about the strength of the Lagos economy. In um, 2016, I and a few friends decided that we should build, you know, the platform house. The name of our company is called Platform Petroleum, and so we should build, build platform house. So we bought a piece of land on Victoria Island. Got the architects, they gave us some very wonderful designs, you know. And then we approached the building authorities for a permit to build. And they came back to us to say that by Lagos State law, all the buildings on that stretch, you know, of road on Victoria Island must be a minimum 15 stories with three floors of parking. So either you have the first three floors, you know, for parking or you have underground parking. So we didn't qualify to build. We had to go back to the drawing board and then came back there and then, you know, did 19 stories. What am I saying to you here? It tells you about the strength of the Lagos economy, that you had your money to build seven stories and it didn't qualify to be built. Now, if I want to do seven stories in Paraco today, some people will park their cars and marvel at what, you know, what was going on. That just tells you the show, you know, the contrast between where, you know, we were okay. you know, at par in 1999, where okay. we are today. So, so that's a, as regards the economic damage. I asked you a question about you having another candidate coming from your same area in Abonema. You know, how's that going to? Because campaign day, both of you from Atuzu, Atuzupuro local government, uh, Agutore, yes. Agutore local government area will have to square it out. Well, you know, it's, um, the elections will not be determined by just Akuto Lega government area. Mm -hmm. And I think that I have the popularity, even in Akuto Lega government area, you know, to win. But then we'll leave that, you know, for the electorate, you know, to decide. And I'm not running purely because, you know, I'm riverine, right? Yes, we need to accommodate those sentiments. But I'm running because, you know, I'm a rivers person. And then I have, you know, a strong network of friends, you know, and supporters, you know, across, you know, you know the entire state. I've done things, you know, for rivers people, to the point, you know, that they trust me, the ordinary man and woman on the streets, you know, know who the Moon Rivers is. I mean, I mean, I have um, name recognition across the entire state because of my antecedents, because it's level of things that I've done, you know, supporting uh, young persons, supporting, you know, students, supporting, uh, you know, the elderly, you know, all of that. And um, basically showing concern about what is, you know, happening with people, right, in their lives, in their communities, you know, and all that. So I have that strong name recognition. And because I'm old, I've also been, you know, the private sector. I'm doing, you know, what I'm doing right now. They think that I could bring private sector experience, you know, to also bear. And because I'm also, you know, a chief, right? I live amongst our people in our local communities. So I see the despair in their faces when, you know, when I, you know, I go to the village every weekend, you know, to spend some time with them, and they share, you know, hopelessness. And also because, you know, as an elite, I've dined, you know with uh, the high and the mighty, you know, in the political parties and all that. I can tell you for certain that even the population, you know, of the wealthy is dwindling. Why is that of the, you know, the poor, right? Of course, you know, it's increasing. And as a young man, you know, who at some point sold cold water on the streets of Port I understand exactly what it is, how, you know, people feel. 
So I've been at the workplace, I know, you know what it takes. Okay. And quite frankly, you know, all of these things, you know, are resonating with the people. So I feel that I stand a very good chance of winning the next elections, regardless of who is, you know, running against me. I like the point you made about you dined with the I am mighty. You left out the wine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that. But, okay, you were quoted in this day. I think was it was yesterday or two days ago. Yeah. That bad leadership is the problem in River State. Who are these bad leaders uh, that you have seen in River State that you want to replace? And what will you do differently? Well, you know, I, um, if, if um, you know, I said that I was quoted out, out of context, I would not have said that. Um, the sort of politics I play is not the one, you know, that name calls. I don't, I, I don't do that. I hold all of them, you know, uh, in very, you know, high esteem. Um, they all have done, you know, their best. I don't think that any one of them, you know, is completely bad. They all have done their best. But of course, you know, the evidence is that their best is just not good enough. Their best, you know, hasn't taken us to where, you know, we ought to be. But I agree that they all have done their own bit, you know, at least today, I mean, we still have a state, you know, that I can see that I want to be governor of. So they've done their own bit, you know, in getting rivers to where rivers it is today. I wouldn't say that we have bad leadership. I would just say that, you know, that the promise, you know, of um, a great, you know, country, a great, a great state, we have a strong, you know, upper mobile population. And they see, you know, what obtains in other climes. And they want to be part of their own story. They want, you know, to experience those things. They want to see those big houses, those, those skyscrapers. They want to have a big cans, you know. They want to, uh, they want to live large. And so how do you make that their reality? You know, it's what is concerning, you know, to everyone. And it's a ticking time bomb. If you have a population you know, of young people who are unemployed, then you know that you have your job cut out for you completely. So that's why you know, my own aspiration is resonating with a lot of people, because they know that, well, I don't only have the heart for the people, I also have the head you know, you know, to get things done. And I've demonstrated that um, in my private lives. And so people have asked me, you know, what are the areas that you're going to look at? You know, how do you, you know, expand the economy? You know, and I've made it very clear to them. You don't have to vote for Dumo Lulu Briggs because you know you know him, because he's a philanthropist. You know you don't you don't have to do that. You have to ask yourself whether or not I have the capacity, right, to grow the institutions of states. Whether or not I have the capacity to expand the economy to accommodate all of us. Right. Can whether we talk not, about how you plan to do that? Because you've just highlighted how River State is comparatively provincial when you compare to Lagos State. So how do you intend to actually boost the economy of River State? And what are the other challenges facing River State and how exactly do you plan to tackle them? Well, you know, it's insecurity. It's um, one of the major issues. Um, unfortunately, you know, um, the, if, if you look at it, you know, the, you know, the numbers, we had capital importation that came into Nigeria in uh, the first quarter of, 20, of, of 2022 of 1 point, you know, um, 1.6 billion. None of that came into River State. So there was no foreign you know, investment in River State. And then there was none you know, in the first quarter of 20, 2009, 2021. There was none in the second quarter of 2021. None in the third quarter of 2021. And there was just you know, $1 million that came in the last quarter of 2021 out of 2.2 .2 billion that came into the country. So you see that, right, that we were lacking in foreign, you know, uh, investment, and that's also because they probably think that uh, the state isn't, you know, very conducive right right now for business. If you also look at the figures, you find that our IGR right is also declining. I mean, in the um, uh, first half of uh, 2021, I think we had about 67 billion, no, 6 billion um, IGR, you know, that, that we're able to, to raise in River State. But of course, you know, in the first quarter of 2022, it's about 50 something billion. So something is, you know, is is eating up, you know, at River State, and then we need to see how we can do things, right, differently. So, like we say, you know, um, politics uh, is war, but um, it's, you know, it's war without um, uh, bloodshed. But we're engaged in that war, and then it's the war against hunger is there, the war against unemployment is there, the war against hate. And I believe that I mean, if you fight those wars, the literacy and all of that successfully. Then of course, you know, the war against insecurity would have been won, you know, 90 percent. And I look at, you know, the rational exuberance of the American economy, and I see that it is propelled by just three inventions, you know, the microchip, the internet, you know, and uh, you ask yourself, and the computer, you ask yourself, 
what can we do, you know, uh, in River State? And so the point for me is that those things didn't just happen, you know. There was a strong, you know, uh, uh, effort to try and fuse together the business community, the, um, uh, uh, the government, you know, and the academia uh, to have an innovation triangle. So I think that is the same sort of thing that we need to do, you know, in River State. And I've already started that by trying to consult with the business community too, so that we know what exactly is, is, is necessary. For education, you know, the key things are access, you know, then relevance is also very, very key. So we're ensuring that everybody would have access. We're ensuring that the quality of education will be great. I mean, because our private schools, you know, were strong, right, when, when I was growing up. I mean, I was a product of um, public schools. I didn't attend nursery schools because my father was poor and we didn't have at the time, you know. But our public schools were quite strong. We had the best of, you know, uh, uh, of teachers. For instance, I mean, at Government Comprehensive School, you know, where I schooled, I was taught English by an Englishman. Our chemistry, physics, and uh, biology lecturers were Indians and Pakistanis. That was our lot, you know, in River State. And I will wish that, you know, that is the lot of every River man, every River woman, every River child. That's not happening today. So there's got to be a lot of investment, you know, in our public schools, you know, to give the young, the young people and the, and the children, you know, the poor, the same access, you know, that the children of the rich, you know, have. I mean, how many of us could afford um, private education? So it's important that we invest very heavily in education. That's going to be key. I'm even running a pilot scheme now. Um, I got an, you know, HMO to register 10, you know, uh, elderly persons uh, by local government, in all 23 local government areas. You know, at um, you know, personal cost, I myself and my friends put together that, that resources just to see how that will work. So that at least for the next for the for the next one year. 10, 10, you know, persons across um, the local government areas, you know, for 70 years and above, will have access, you know, to free Medicare. Now, the reason for that is to see how, you know, that is going to work and see if we can, you know, replicate that when we form, you know, government and also see if it's possible for us to bring that, you know, also, also to accommodate the other very vulnerable group, you know, of, the, of, of those of us, you know, who will be from zero age, you know, to, you know, to about six. So these are some of the pilot schemes that we're looking at. Because I mean, we want to hit the ground running from day one. So I'm not going to say that uh, we'll probably meet, you know, UNESCO st you know, standards for for funding of education, you know, on year one. But I'm saying that you know it's going to be increased progressively as we go on, you know, so that um, we're, we're able to get young people, you know, into schools. The reason for that is that we want to be prepared, you know, as rivers people. Now, perhaps the next big innovations and all that may come out of River State, you know. Uh, and if it doesn't come out of the reverse, let our people be prepared to take advantage of those innovations. We know, and then of course we know that these innovations, you know, when okay. they come. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, we'd like to say a very big thank you to you for your time. I mean, coming to share this, and I'm sure the reverse people are watching and they are listening.